Now, let's start writing the analog monitor code. Uh, at first, we'll start with the Arduino analog monitor code. And the first order of business uh, is to start with to lay out the design. We want to create a simple analog signal sampler using the analog read function, send the sampled analog data to the EPT570 board using the address and a write enable signal. Then we'll repeat this block of code for each channel. So let's uh, go to the port setup. What we want to realize is that using port writes is much faster than using the built-in uh, functions in, uh, in Arduino processing. We will use the port write to transfer 10-bit ADC sample and use it to set the address and for the write enable. So port D is an 8-bit port that is used to connect the lower 8 bits of the sample to the input of the APT 570AP. Bits 8 and 9 of the sample are connected to bits 4 and 5 of port B. The address for the end terms is 3 bits and occupies bits 1, 2, 3 of port B. There is also a 1-bit control line which will be used to inform the CPLD that a byte is ready to be written to the USB. This is bit 0 of port B, also called the write enable. Don't get too confused, just uh, follow the table above here. The ports and pins of the analog monitor project must be initialized in the setup function. The setup function will only run once after each power up of Reset Arduino. So open up the Arduino sketch pad and let's start writing some code. So the first order of business is we want to set up a setup function. So type in void setup open parentheses close parentheses then our familiar little curly brackets. Then to uh, open up the port D we're going to type in that DDRD and set it those to 1 uh, using the, the, the bit marker. Uh, this uh, will set up all uh, of the pins in port D as outputs. Next we want to write uh, port D and equals the bit operator. Uh, set those to all ones. This will turn on the port D pins. Next we want to set up port B as uh, the bottom six bits as outputs. So again we're going to type in DDRB, set that equal to B00, and then six ones. And again, uh, set uh, port B uh, to zeros as we don't want to set anything out on the port at this time. So type in an ending curly bracket to end the setup function. Next we'll uh, start with the loop function. So here, um, when the code executes, uh, the first thing we want to do is start reading the analog signals. And we're going to use the analog read function to, to convert the analog signal into a 10-bit digital word. So we'll use a variable ADC value, set that equal to analog read, and then put a channel in there. For the first channel, let's, we'll call it zero. Next, we will we'll send the bottom eight bits of ADC value 
out to port D. So since we have the bottom eight bits uh, set up on the port, we now need to set the bits eight and nine to port B. So we'll create a, another variable called upper ADC value. Set that to equal to the ADC value, and here we're going to mask off everything except for bits 8 and 9 of ADC value, and that's how we do that with the AND uh, hex 300. Uh, let's go ahead right now and type in, create the, uh, uh, the two integers, our ADC value and upper ADC value. So, to get this in the proper position on port B, we have to do a shift. And we'll do a right shift uh, operator, which is the two arrows, and then put a 4 out there. That means we're going to right shift by 4 bits. So, next thing we want to do is to set up our address on and the bits 8 and 9 onto port B. So we'll go ahead and do a uh, write to port B. And so here's how we do that. We'll say um, port B is equal to B00010. And that, that 0010, the bottom four bits, that sets up the address. Or that with upper ADC value. Now the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and set the write enable pin high. And this will inform the CPLD to read the port D and the port B values and store those. And that will cause the, uh, the CPLD to store the 10-bit value, which spans port D and port B, and also store the 3-bit address that are at bits 1, 2, and 3 of port B. Next, immediately after that, set the write enable pin to zero and that will inform the CPLD that the data transfer is over and to start it into its state machine to transfer the bottom eight bits and the top eight bits to the USB. Let's just cover the timing very quickly about what's going on in the code. So what is happening in the code is, as you can see, you can see the timelines here, the ADC conversion, 10-bit digitized value, the interim address, and the write enable. So when the analog read function is called, the, analog, the ADC conversion will start and it will read whatever is on that channel zero line. Then shortly after that, the bottom 8 bits value is put onto the port D. The next is the uh, address and the 8 bits 8 and 9 are put onto ports B and D. Next the write enable goes high, indicate the PLD to start its uh, uh, conversion. And after that the write enable goes low and the next channel is read, puts its valid uh, ADC value onto ports B or D, and then the address is asserted. Next, we'll repeat the initial code block for the remaining five channels. The coding of the ADC channel reads, address set, and write enable assert will occur consecutively with each instruction set. So here you can see we filled in the code and we get all the way down to the bottom of the loop, put the curly bracket in. This will inform the loop function to go back to the top and start over again. Now here, we're going to add in a slight delay, a delay of 10, 10 milliseconds. Now this is, uh, turns out to be useful because we're actually writing six times on the uh, C-sharp code to the to the display and that takes a, a little bit of time so adding a little bit of delay here 
uh, is, is good for the C sharp side. So next we want to compile the code and we'll just hit the verify button and the, the Arduino Uno will compile it. When it's done compiling it'll tell you at the bottom if there's any errors. Next thing we want to do is to plug into the Arduino Uno and actually program it. Go to Tools, Serial Port, and select the appropriate COM port of the Arduino. This port will be the one selected when the Arduino driver loaded previously. Next, click on the Upload button. The IDE will indicate that the code is uploading. When it's complete, the message will show up in the lower left corner. So that's all that's needed for the Arduino code. Now let's start on the Analog Monitor CPLD code. So what we're going to do is look at the uh, overview of the code. So the, the EPT 570P will accept the digitized data sampled by the Arduino and transferred to the PC. The Active Transfer Library is used to send the data to the PC. This is done through Active Transfer End Terms. And they're used to connect the Active Transfer Library to the user code. This makes it easy to transfer data to and from the PC via the USB. The user needs to create a state machine to control the transfer between the incoming data and the active transfer end terms. All of the C code here is written in Verilog. So the analog monitor project needs to accept a 10-bit value spans across the J connector and the J10 connector. Three bits select the transfer end term address to transmit on and the right enable bit is used to start the state machine which latches all values with digitized value. Because the active transfer library runs at 66 megahertz we'll need to add some code here to ensure that the slower right enable signal from the Arduino can latch the data into the transfer end term. So set up your Verilog code starting with the module and the name of the project at the top, EPT 570 APU2 underscore top. And we need to set up some inputs and outputs for the top file. The IO nets are declared in the port section of the Verilog code. The first port block is used to connect the active transfer library to the pins of the USB device. The next port block is used to connect the code to the Arduino. The next three blocks are used to connect up the bus transceivers. The outputs include direction, output enable bits, and a final block for the switch and LEDs. Next, the parameters are defined. These are used as constants in the user code. These include the control register, state machine parameters, used to define the states and the decode of those particular signals. USB transfer state machines are included as parameters, and a global reset count used to declare the maximum length of the reset. Next up, the internal registers uh, and signals are declared. This will be used to, uh, as the internal to the CPLD code to hold values and indicate when to perform some actions. Next, we add the assignments. These assignments will set the direction of the bus transceivers that interface the Arduino IOs into the CPLD. The transceivers are also include an output enable bit. We've also got LEDs and we also have a transfer out byte which is set by the state machine uh, to declare which is the when to send the upper byte and the lower byte. First block of code is used to generate the reset signal. The reset signal is generated by a counter that starts counting on power up and when the counter reaches the global reset count the reset signal is asserted. Next is the input uh, registers. This will um, uh, send the inputs from the Arduino to clock registers and it will eliminate any noise on those signals uh, from propagating through to the state machine of the CPLD. So first up we have the transfer control register state machine. This is what sets the start stop control signal uh, as that is received from the uh, Visual C Sharp code. So this register is set by using the transfer control state machine. Uh, if the start stop control signal is set, the CPLD code will enter the conditional branch code and wait for the write enable signal to assert. 
the transfer control state machine will read the control register from the host PC using the active transfer end term of address number 2. The state machine will decode the 8-bit control register only after a sequence of three 8-bit bytes in the order of 0x5a, then a 0xc3, then a 7e. So when the uh, in the first state, the transfer control the state machine will stay in the idle state until a byte from the active transfer end term is transferred over. Uh, it has to be 5A. This will cause it to go to transfer control HDR1. The state machine will stay in transfer control HDR1 uh, until the next byte is read. If the next byte is read is a C3, it will cause the transfer control state machine to go into transfer control HDR2. We'll sit there and wait to in this state until the next byte. If it receives a, a C3, then it moves on to the next state and the next state until finally it gets back, until finally the control register byte is decoded and stored. Next, we will add the transfer detection signal from the Arduino. This block will sample the write enable signal and wait for it to go high. This block will use four registers to control the data and starting the, of the state machine. Uh, this is the transfer write reg. This is used to latch the register to hold the state of the write enable. The transfer write, this register is used to start the state machine and initiate the multi-byte write to the PC. Transfer write data, this is a 10-bit register to hold the value of the analog sample from the Arduino. And then transfer address, which is an 8-bit register to hold the end term address from the Arduino. So the start start control signal is monitored every clock cycle. If it is sampled high, the output enable of the bus transceivers are set low and the outputs become active. When the start stop start stop control signal goes low, the output enables of the transceivers are set high and it sets the outputs to inactive. So this block will compare the input signal of the analog monitor enable to a high. Now the analog uh, monitor is a registered version of the write enable signal. When the bit goes high, the priority encoder goes into a statement 1 and sets the transfer write reg and transfer write high, latches the value of the analog monitor upper byte and analog monitor lower byte to the transfer write data register. The analog monitor address will be set to the transfer address. By setting transfer write reg high, the priority encoder goes to statement 2, which will set the transfer write register to low and stay in statement 2 until the priority uh, of the priority encoder. When the analog monitor enable signal goes low, the encoder will reset transfer write reg and transfer write to low. The encoder goes back to waiting for the analog monitor enable to assert high in a essentially a wait loop. An actor active transfer end term must be selected in order to send a byte across the USB bus. Each end term has its own address and the user code must assert one bit in the vector start transfer in order to initiate a USB transfer across the end term. You can think of these transfer end terms as channels. So the bit selection is performed using a case statement. When the USB transfer state machine is in the start transfer state, the end term is selected by the transfer address. And the transfer address is the registered version of the Arduino ADC channel. So next up is the USB transfer state machine. Uh, it's a one hot finite state machine. Uh, it uses two always statements. The first always uh, block is synchronous and it moves the state machine from one state to the next state. The second always block is the asynchronous and it is used to select which state uh, will go to next. All the outputs are handled in their own always block and separate from the state machine. The state machine stays in state idle until the analog monitor enable signal goes high. When the signal goes high, the state machine goes into the start transfer state. The state causes the transfer out signal to latch an end term selection based on the transfer address. This first state does not have a conditional branch, so it immediately goes into the first byte enable state. In this state, the upper byte to be transferred over the USB will be selected. A conditional branch causes the state machine to stay in the state until the signal first byte complete goes high.
the next state is first byte ready. Here the byte has been transferred into the active transfer in term. The state waits until the byte has been transferred across the USB and waits for the transfer busy array to go to zero. Next, the state machine progresses to state second byte enable and selects the lower byte to be transferred over the USB. A conditional branch causes the state machine to stay in the state until the second byte complete signal goes high. Upon its assertion, the state machine proceeds to second byte ready. And in this state, the code waits until the byte has been transferred across the USB and the transfer busy array goes to zero. Upon successful completion of the second byte transfer, the state machine goes back to the state idle and waits for analog monitor signal to go high and start the process over again. Next up is the instantiation for the active transfer library. Now here the ports include the input and output pins and the two output buses that connect the active modules to the active transfer library. <coughs> and these buses are the input bus UCN, which is a 24-bit, and an out output UC out, which is a 22-pin bus. The UC port must be shared amongst all of the active end terms. Since they all can drive this bus, a bus-wide wired OR circuit is used so they don't drive each other. And note that we have to put the number of modules in the parameter n, which is 6. So finally, we instantiate the end terms. The active transfer end terms has a port for the address UC ADDR. This allows the PC to address up to eight different modules. Just add three bits uh, for the address to this port and the PC must use the same address to communicate with this module. Also, note the end term transfer is started using a bit in the vector start transfer array. The end term uses the transfer busy array to inform the user code that the end term cannot accept another byte at this time, and the byte to be transferred is transfer out byte. Now that we have all the code put together, let's compile this and produce a programming file. So the Cordis 2 application will compile synthesize the user code, active transfer library, and the active end terms. The result of this step is a file containing the CPLD code with the star.pof at the end. This pof file will be programmed into the CPLD. First, we need to create a project in the Cortis 2 environment. So, uh, go ahead and bring up Cortis 2, then use Windows Explorer to browse over to the C, uh, Altera, uh, in this case 12.1 Service Pack 2, Cortis, Q Designs, and create a directory labeled EPT underscore 570 underscore AP underscore U2 underscore top. Next, go to the new project wizard and in the name of the project, type in EPT underscore 570 underscore AP underscore U2 underscore top. Now, this is needed so, because this name has to correlate with the name of the module um, of the code. So, go ahead and type that in. Click next. Here we're going to add files, so uh, click the Browse button and go to the CD, the um, UNO EPT Analog Project, and select the folder underneath there called Projects HDL EPT Analog Monitor EPT 570AP U2 top, and Select the following files active transfer .vqm, the active transfer library .vqm, the, the EPT 570 APU2 top .v, and the EPT wire or .v. Select those files, click next, go to the device settings. We're going to go down to Max 2 and look for the EPM 570T well, 100C5. Select that. Uh, click to the summary page and then hit finish wrap up. So here 
we'll be ready to select the uh, pin assignments. So go to in, go to assignments, import, hit the browse button, and again go back to the uh, the Uno uh, EPT Analog Monitor Project CD and go to Projects HDL. And then go into the EPT 570 APU2 top folder and choose the uh, f uh, file with the .qsf. And select that, hit open, hit OK. What this is doing is importing all our pins. So next, now we've got everything ready to go, hit the compile button and the synthesizer will kick in and, and go through all the code synthesize it, map it out, and then fit it into the floor plan of the EPM 570. So, okay, so that, that completed. Next we want to add some timing constraints. So to add the timing constraint file, we need to bring up the Windows Explorer, and we're going to go to the CD again, the UNO EPT Analog Monitor Project, and go uh, to Projects HDL, go under EPT 578PU2 top folder, and then scroll down to where you see the EPT 578PU2 top dot SDC, that's our Synopsis Design Constraint file. So copy that file, and then scroll up to uh, the Altera project, so go to Altera, Q Designs, the EPT 578PU2 top and just paste it in there. So now our constraint file is in the folder and the uh, synthesizer will pick it up. So go ahead and re hit a recompile and it will compile and go to the floor planner lay out the entire design and then produce a .pof file. And so now we're okay and we have our design uh, constraints in there and our setup and hold times are okay here. Just, uh, just set up a, a clock and give, uh, give it the right values for the clock. So next we are ready to program the EPT 570 board. So go up under programmer, uh, uh, tools programmer and here, make sure that your uh, your board is, is plugged in, of course, with the USB cable. Go into the Hardware Select button, and under Hardware Select, uh, if the board is in there and everything's and the the DLL is inserted, you'll see the EPT Blaster version 1.3b. So double click on that, and that will select that that tool. So next, come back to the programmer, and want to make sure that uh, we have the file added into uh, such a file. So just hit Add File button, go to Output Files, double click on that, and you'll see the, the .puf file. Go ahead and select that, come back to the uh, Programmer window, hit the Program Configure radio buttons, make sure they're selected. Hit the Start button, and you'll see that the device will get programmed. You can see the green bar up at the upper right. So at this point the EPT 570 board is programmed and ready to be used. So that's it for part two. Next uh, locate part number three and, and play that video to learn how to do the C-sharp code.